In the 70s, one of the most controversial troubled teen schools was founded. Instead of simply punishing unacceptable behavior, we've been looking for ways to change that behavior. This facility, called Elan, claims to be able to do that. A forced fighting ring for misbehaving children, extended stays in isolation rooms, human feces being poured over children as punishments. Despite evidence of flagrant child abuse and the denial of basic human rights, the school's abusive practices flew under the radar and it only became more popular. Today, we learn about the Alarm School and go down the rabbit hole of how it operated for over 30 years. It sounds like the founder of Elan was a sociopath, and there's evidence that sociopaths rise in these places very easily. Greetings, comrades. My name is Lucy, and welcome back to Learning Things. Today, we are talking about what was referred to once as the Rolls Royce of adolescent treatment centers. Look, buckle up, is all I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be laughing throughout this. That is not to detract from any of these kids who were actually like genuinely abused. I am laughing because it is just like unbelievable to think that this is this happened and is still going on around America in some cases. But oh, so in 1970, Joseph Ricci, along with Dr. Gerald Davidson and investor David Goldberg, founded the Alan School. It was marketed as a private co-educational residential behavior modification program. Say that five times fast. I dare you. It was certified as part of NATSAP, which in America, it stands for the National Association of Therapeutic Schools and Programs. And NATSAP basically acts as like a body for um, all of these kind of programs and residential camps and things like that. So you'd think that because it was certified under NATSAP that, like, there'd be some form of regulation. We're going to forget about the word regulation for this episode. We don't know it. We've never heard of her. Okay? They bought a 33-hectare campus that was previously a hunting lodge in Poland, Maine. I always find it funny when there's, like, a, like, Poland, Maine. It's just, it's confusing. Like, there's a Texas in Queensland, and it's always a bit of a, like, why, why do we just change the name. And this former hunting lodge, this campus, 33 hectares, became the first campus for the Alan School. But back to Joseph Ricci for a second. He was actually a former heroin addict himself. And the basis of his like understanding of treatment was that he had helped youth in his recovery and after like since his recovery. And he wanted to create like a place for people to go, not necessarily kids. He wanted it to be like kind of like a therapeutic rehab system, but like long-term stays. But they pivoted to the youth market, likely because they realized a couple of things. Firstly, they could charge a lot more because it was uh, like children under care under the age of 18, and they required an educational system to go along with their program. So, you know, there's educational costs there that they could just throw in as part of the fee. The second thing is, is they could hold kids for far longer than they could hold an adult because an adult has, you know, free will. And if they're over the age of 18, you can just sign yourself out of any rehab center. It's, you know, it's it does come down to a lot of self-motivation, whereas a kid, someone who is under the age of 18 and under control of their parents would need parental approval to to be able to leave. Knowing this, they realized that putting on a facade for the parents wasn't too difficult. Now let's get into a couple of different costs associated with Elan. To enroll your child at Elan in the 70s, for one year, it was 50,000 US dollars. This was the 70s once again, so to account for inflation, the cost today would be $286,000 a year. But if it costs so much to go there, you'd assume that, you know, the system is really nice. It's a lovely place. You're going to get incredible care and therapy and treatment for whatever issue your child has. So if it's so good, why would the kids want to leave? Let's get into it. <laughs> so the kids that were sent to Alan, it was usually seen of as like a last stop situation for them, for a really troubled teen. But troubled teen is wildly and was wildly subjective as a term, because on one hand, you did have, you know, 13 year olds who were getting involved with really hard drugs, getting in with the wrong crowds and their lives were kind of going down a really poor direction than their parents would have liked them to go. So on one hand, you do have some kids that are going through some serious shit like that. But on the other hand, you had parents who were either really religious 
or just had a much stricter view on their children and how their children should behave. So the reasons for sending a chid, a chid, a kid to Alan varied wildly. Like there were some kids who were just like not getting straight A's and they'd be sent to Alan. And the problem with that, which we'll get in to shortly, is that that's a really bizarre atmosphere to have like a conglomerate of kids that like aren't really able to relate to each other in that sense. Like at least when you go to rehab as an adult or as a as a teenager at a proper place, you can relate to the people around you in the sense that like everyone there has had an issue with substance abuse or, you know, addic- addiction, whatever. But if you've got kids that are like genuinely recovering heroin addicts at like 16 and they've been sent to Alan because they their parents want them to get off hard drugs, how are they going to relate to someone and vice versa who has just been sent there because their parents think they're not getting like good enough grades or they're like talking back at the dinner table? You know, it's like they're a very... <laughs> wildly different situations going on here. So the selection procedure had nothing to do with the kid. And it's very clear when you look at those fees. So they would be referred to by maybe a doctor in their area. Maybe it would be word of mouth. Maybe some other parent had sent their kid away and they were like, oh yeah, he seems to really love it over there. Like maybe you should give it a go for Kevin or whatever the fuck you've named your kid. Hopefully not Kevin. In fact, Alan would even offer to send their private plane across the country to pick up a troubled teen to bring it back to Alain. Like, obviously, this is straight off the bat. We have to establish this is for the wealthy. It always was. But it still does... eh, Impress is not the right word. It's fascinating to me that it spread word of mouth so well in the 70s, like, no internet, that they were sending private planes across the country to pick up kids. And they managed to keep the school in high regards with the parents and with doctors in the area so incredibly well that there was no problem, like no one could see a problem. The fact that Joseph Ricci and his, you know, Goldberg was the investor's name, which huge shock there with that last name. The fact that, you know, they're happy to send a, a private plane across the country from New England to California to pick up someone's kid is a testament to the level of wealth you needed to be able to send your kid to one of these schools. So going back to this first campus, this 33 hectare lodge in Maine, it was a semi-rural area, obviously, former hunting lodge. And some of the kids report driving in when their parents are dropping them off or whatever the case was, looking around and being like, oh, this this looks cool. This looks like a summer camp. Like this kind of looks nice. This This might be a good place for me. But then as they kept driving through this road, they started to notice that the structures and the buildings were starting to get a little bit more like dilapidated as they kept going and and the you know the maintenance wasn't a hundred percent but that was if you were lucky enough to be like driven there with your parents um a lot of the time kids were like the old classic literally woken up in the middle of the night at three o'clock in the morning by three very burly large men being told that they're taking the kid to the alarm school like being told hi get up now because we're taking you to this school and you've got no choice and like i'm implying that they were quite forceful and probably extremely intimidating. There's records that suggest that these men were like ex-hitmen. Fuck. <laughs> wow. We're really, we're really setting the tone here. And not that the kids would have known that they were hitmen, but like to, to give you an idea of how intimidating these men probably were in your bedroom at three o'clock in the morning with your little Spider-Man pajamas on. Was Spider-Man out in the 70s? I certainly don't think there would be merchandised pajamas for it in the 70s. 1970s Spider-Man pajamas? No way. Vintage, authentic, 1977 Marvel, The Amazing Spider-Man Kids Pajamas. I stand corrected by myself. It's a great world we live in. I learn every day. But basically, once the kid got to the school and the parents were out of sight, it became a completely different environment to what was painted in the brochures. So Alan was run as kind of like a Lord of the Flies type situation where there was a working microcosm of the workforce, like the the prisoners ran the prison kind of thing. In order to graduate from Alan, you had to move through a set of ranks. And as you were promoted higher and higher up to a certain point, that is when you would be eligible for graduation. It had nothing to do with your age or your education level. And it had everything to do with this rank system. 
When you first arrived, you were what was known as a non-strength. Now, the names that I'm about to say, like the names of these ranks, they're, they're a bit weird. So like, don't feel inadequate if you're listening and being like, Lucy, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't either half the time. But yeah, you when you first got to Alan, the term that they referred to as was a non-strength. You were nothing, basically. You were like, your only jobs were to like mop the floors, sweep, dust, clean toilets, things like that. When you were a non-strength, you weren't allowed to talk to another non-strength without the presence of a strength there to monitor the conversation. So like, for example, if you arrived within like a couple of days of another kid who was getting there for the first time, you weren't allowed to talk to that kid who had just gotten there with you without the presence of someone higher up there to listen to every word of your conversation. You weren't even allowed to go to the bathroom on your own. Like, to, it really sets the tone from the beginning of like, I imagine it was quite testing for kids to get there and chances are when you're sent to a school like this, you're already having issues with authority. But to then be put into such a situation where you have absolutely zero freedom. Yeah, it really sets the tone for <laughs> the rest of this. There was the service crew, which were essentially janitors. There was the kitchen crew, which were, you know, chefs, waiters, cleaning the kitchen. They handled everything, food prep, everything in the kitchen, all that. The business office would be responsible for filing paperwork to do with the actual running of the Alain School. <laughs> and then the communications office handled everything incoming and outgoing. So letters from home, phone calls, news, etc. So once you had worked for quite some time, and we'll get into, you know, the timeline in a little bit. But once you had made your way from a non-strength, you would start first as an expediter. And that was your first time as, as a strength. Expediters were responsible for security. They were basically like, it was, it was a policeman type role for the school. The expediter is a policeman, very much like the policemen out in society. Uh, they play the same role. They're the line of defense between the normal people and the lunatics. As an expediter, you were assigned to a certain area. So all of the kids within that area, you were responsible for. And think like hall monitor, but on crack, because you had a, a clipboard with all of the names of all of the kids that were in your kind of jurisdiction. And it was set up like a table with hour by hour by hour spaces to write notes. You were meant to record the moving and activities of all of the kids on that sheet, hour by hour. You had to watch doors to make sure that nobody was running away. You had to do night watches. And you were also responsible for reporting any negative behavior. And if you didn't report negative behavior and it got back that you knew about it and you were the expediter on duty at the time, you would get in trouble. From expediter, you would then move into department head. And you could be the leader of any of the kind of areas that I said before. So like service crew, kitchen, communications, office. Then after you had moved up from department head, you would move up to what was known as a shingle. The shingle was the head of the expediters. And then once you moved past shingle, you were what was known of as a coordinator. It was kind of the last step. Uh, you would be like coordinator on duty for your area. So for example, if you were in like the kitchen crew and you were coordinator on duty, you were the boss of the kitchen crew for that whole day. You were responsible for absolutely anything. And this is where it gets kind of bizarre because if you were the coordinator on duty for the business office, you were responsible for all the like ingoings and outgoings of all of the like uh, checks and balances to do with like legitimate school fees and like the running of the school. Like you don't, adults should be doing this. Sorry, stuttered my way to that. But really, when I do these episodes, I won't lie, it's kind of hard because by the time I sit down to record, I've already researched it so much that it's like old news to me. But like I have to get back into the mood when I'm like <laughs> talking about this in front of the microphone to be like, this is fucking bizarre. And I can't drive that home enough that like these children who were being sent there for rehabilitation because they either had a drug problem or a severe attitude issue or like weren't doing well in school were suddenly responsible for handling thousands of dollars a day. <laughs> anyway, it's so it's already feeling a bit weird. You know what? I'm sick and tired of your garbage around here. You know what? I gotta deal with your skank. I do that! So remembering that this is a 
therapeutic residential in-house co-educational behavioral modification program. <laughs> the actual practice of therapy at Elan was bizarre, given the fact that there was not a single licensed therapist, psychologist or psychiatrist on the campus. They really were just winging it, according to Joseph Ricci's decisions and opinions on how to fix, quote unquote, a child. And just to briefly cover the education they received, it's briefly not because I've decided to make it brief, because they did. Uh, education was considered a right, but you had to earn that right. And education took place between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. Those were the That was the window of your schooling per day. I saw something that alleged that the reason this was the case was because Joseph Ricci thought it was easier when uh, to like manipulate the kids when they were already a little bit tired and exhausted, not necessarily during education, but to make their day so full and then expect them to like use their brain between the hours of 7 p.m. till 11 p.m. and then wake up at 7 a.m. the next day is going to help weaken them throughout the day. So it's not like he was trying to manipulate them during the educational hours. It's just that that's why that was put there. I don't know how much that's true. He didn't say it himself, but I think it's believable. There was no homework, no tests, no projects. Um, for example, maths class consisted of basically just getting a maths book. And then by the end of the class, you just had to hand in one page of completed work. There was no real syllabus. There was no real regulations. There's that word I'm not supposed to use. So now that we've got education out of the way, let's get into just, you know, general life at Elan. There was this really fun practice where there was a box at the front of the house with a sheet of paper that you could pull out. And on the sheet of paper, it had to and from. And then under that, there was a list of all of these negative emotions. So like sad, furious, angry, enraged, you know, really kind of like violent negative emotions. So if you had the shits with someone, you were meant to take this piece of paper and fill it out accordingly. So for example, to Jamie from Lucy, and then I would circle enraged and furious. And then at what was called encounter group, you would all sit around with your little slip of paper that they might pull out of a box. I'm actually not sure what the procedure was, but that's where this paper would come into play. And I would basically just cuss the shit out of Jamie for stealing my pearly shine lip gloss or for whatever it was, you know, like you would circle these emotions and then you were expected to just yell at the top of your lungs at that person to get your emotions out, I guess. Yell at the person, swear at them. Degrade them. Cunt. Whore. Needle dick. Fucking slut. You could say anything you wanted to. If you weren't intense enough, and I mean like if you weren't looking that person directly in the eye, cussing them out, cussing their family out, just being generally abusive towards them, if you weren't intense enough, you'd end up getting in trouble. One girl uh, recounted her kind of stay at Alan and she said that she wasn't a type, the type of person to really want to get angry at someone. And she never, also never was. She never had an issue with anyone like around her at Elan. So whenever she had to do it, she would just like yell at them, but like insults that didn't make any sense. She didn't really give any examples, but you can kind of see what she's trying to do. Like she's trying to appease them by being aggressive and yelling at the top of their lungs. But like she wasn't saying anything that would directly hurt the person she was talking to. Probably just leave them a little bit confused. <laughs> but she ended up getting in a fucking lot of trouble because she wasn't participating in the way that they wanted her to. There was also something called primal scream therapy where you were expected to like repeat a phrase that resonated with what you were struggling with at the top of your lungs and just howl in a group and just scream and like let it out, I guess. And, you know, it's not so shocking to hear that there wasn't a licensed therapist on the grounds of that school the further we get into this. This chapter is called Punishment at Elan, but it's really more of a day-to-day -day overview of what it was like if you were a child at this school. Like some of the things I'm about to say could have been put in the part before about therapy. Because technically, all of these practices were seen of as the therapeutic activities that the school would use to break down a kid. 
But to be completely honest, um, it does just smell a whole lot of child abuse to me. So here we go. They refer to rules as guilts. They were huge on guilt at Elan. It was, you know, their main premise of, of kind of breaking down a kid to fix their attitude or fix their drug problem. It was really focused on guilt. No sex, no drugs, no violence. And this is what they would kind of say to the parents. And the parents would be like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Cool. But there was a whole lot of unofficial rules that became very widely known after like so many kids came out and were like, yeah, that happened to us. Yes, that happened to me. Yes, that happened. So these weren't just one-offs. These were happening all the time. They just weren't publicly known to the parents when they were enrolling their kids. So before we get into this, it's not like the parents knew any of this shit happened. All they saw was no drugs, no violence, no sex. This list of rules will have your fucking head rolling. We'll start off with one of my favourites. If you were a non-strength and you got caught reading without reading privileges, you were in trouble. Yep. Yes, that's right. When you first arrived at the school, you weren't actually allowed to read a book, read anything, read a pamphlet, literally anything. If you got caught reading without your reading privileges, you were in trouble. Writing or drawing without permission, talking too loudly, talking too softly, looking at the opposite gender, being attracted to someone, which is a really bizarre one. Like, surely that's subjective, but who am I to poke holes in the logic of any of this? Looking out windows for too long, pretending to sleep at night, thinking of running away, (laughs) being in the bathroom for too long, talking too much or too little, showering for more than three minutes, making facial reactions to orders, so like if you like subtly rolled your eyes or something, negative body language, oversleeping, undersleeping, smiling and more. The smiling one is no joke. If you were a non-strength, for example, and you smiled at something where it wasn't necessarily an environment where they expected you to smile, or if they just caught you smiling by yourself, that was a guilt and you would get in trouble. So if you broke one of these rules, you would usually get what was known as a general meeting, which for all intents and purposes appeared to be somewhat of like a hearing, except there was no real input from you. Like your side of the story held... 2% weight. Your presence there was really just A, because you had to be there and B, to learn your fate. So let's get into some of the lovely punishments you may have been subjected to had you have broken any of those rules. I'm going to use an example. So let's say you started to develop like an innocent crush on one of the other kids there, which for any of us, I think looking back in our teenage years, like tween teen years from the ages of like 12 to 17 or 18, that's very easy to do. (laughs) However, maybe a strength, maybe a higher up noticed that you were staring at this person a little too long for their liking. You would probably get a general meeting and then they might decide that you were to be brandished with a sign. The sign probably would say something on it like, I'm a slut or I'm a whore. And it would be like a really big sign, like a sandwich board size sign that that would be tied around your neck and like hung over your shoulders and across the front of your body. And you were allowed to make the sign yourself. You could get, you could use glitter, you could use colored pens, things like that. They weren't completely restrictive of creativity, but your sign did say things like, I am a slut, ask me why I'm a raging whore and no one likes me. All because you were looking at a boy because you had an innocent crush on someone and you were meant to wear this sign for as long as they deemed necessary. Every time you walked into a room, you had to announce yourself and then say, you know, ask me why I may insert adjective here. And all of the kids were encouraged to actually interrogate you about it. They were encouraged to swear at you, abuse you, uh, like verbally, and make you feel guilty for whatever your reason for wearing the sign is. One girl had to wear a sign that said, ask me why I'm a whore, because she held hands with someone. And if you didn't interrogate a kid with a sign on and like swear at them and like verbally abuse them, you would get in trouble as well. There was also the costume punishment, which I think is like one of the really bad ones in terms of like, just can you imagine? (laughs) So when they felt that the sign wasn't enough, they would employ what was known as like the costume punishment. So you would get a costume 
that reflected your crime, your guilt. Using our example from before about like just having a crush on someone, based on a guilt like that, this is actually a real example. One girl was made to dress like a prostitute on a street corner. So she was dressed like like a prostitute and she even had like a cardboard sign with like a street sign on it. And she was made to wear that for as long as they deemed necessary. If they thought you were behaving like a baby, you were actually dressed up like a baby with a diaper, no shirt, bonnet, um, pacifier or dummy, depending on where you are in the world. It was just bizarre and that's not even the worst costume so far. One girl who had syphilis was made to wear a crown of tampons around her head. Make that make sense. And then this is my favorite example from the costume one. Favorite as in it's not fun at all. It just gives you an idea of how uh, psycho this was. So one kid noticed that one of the other Alan schools, because there were other like houses, they were numbered. So there was like Alan one, two, three, four. I think it went up to like seven or eight. Um, one kid noticed that one of the other houses had like this gorgeous golden retriever. And he was like, God, that would that would actually be really nice. I reckon we could all benefit from like a, a house dog. And so he went and suggested it to a higher up. And he was like, oh, I, I just thought like maybe if you wanted to think about it, like we'd all love a dog. However, he got a general meeting for this and they decided that if he wanted a dog so much for the house, he should be the dog. So he was dressed up like a dog. He wasn't allowed to speak. It was bark once for yes, bark twice for no. He was expected to crawl around on all fours. He received a dog dish for dinner. He had to do tricks. People would walk him like with a leash around his neck. It's just absurd. And yet that is a mild punishment compared to the ones I'm about to get into. There was what was known as the corner. So this is like, you know, your classic go sit in the naughty corner type of thing, except the minimum stay was between three to five days, sometimes weeks or months at a time. You had to go stand in a corner and face the wall and you weren't allowed to turn around, you weren't allowed to talk, you weren't allowed to do anything. Once you couldn't stand anymore, they'd give you a chair. And then when it came to, you know, nighttime, they would bring a mattress in at midnight and then take it away immediately at 7 a.m. There were open swearing privileges given to every other kid in the school and you were expected to go up and just like yell at this person who was in the corner and just make them feel like shit, basically. It comes back to the guilt thing. You were meant to go up, ask them why they're in the corner, just like hurl abuse at them and make them feel really shit about themselves. One girl was there for so long that she started to talk to herself and so she was punished for that. And her punishment was that every other kid in the house, one by one, spanked her. Hate that word, but it's the only appropriate one. Like literally she bent over the chair and everyone came up with a paddle and just fucking whacked her. It's really absurd. And I like we're only <laughs> we're only halfway through this. Some kids had to stay in that corner for as long as six months. Yeah. There was also the isolation room, which similar to any prison kind of followed the same practice. You were just shut in a completely dark room for weeks, months at a time until they deemed you were ready to come out. And there's a really, really awful story. For some reason, they put like multiple kids in the room. I think there were like two boys and a girl. Like the kids that this happened to, some of them came out and it's just like a really awful story of how they basically just like sexually assaulted each other and like raped the girl and then one of the boys got raped because he didn't want to get involved in it. It's fucking shocking is the only way I can really put it. And then there was the ring. This was seen of as like a last resort and it was allegedly only used when a child had either threatened violence or been violent. So if they had like threatened someone that they were going to like fight them or whatever, they would get sentenced to the ring. And what would happen is 10 or 15 kids would form a circle and there would be what was known as the house champion. So the house would decide on someone to fight on behalf of the school then they would fight the bully. Like, well, they called it the bully. It was really just a kid who had, like, probably just gotten really fucking frustrated and said, like, I'm going to kill you or whatever to someone. Which, like, when, like, what we've gone through so far, I would probably have murder on my mind as well. So it's not to say that all the kids that got sentenced to the ring actually did a bad thing or, like, you know, subjectively there's levels to it, of course, but 
for the most part, there's no reason to ever employ this ever. <laughs> but the house champion was always also like it was rigged. The house champion was huge. The biggest kid would be picked. They'd be like six foot three or six foot one or however tall they were, pretty big. And it didn't matter how big they were in comparison to the kid they were fighting. If this kid was like five foot eight and lanky and skinny, it didn't matter. They'd still get the biggest kid they could find to ha- fight as the house champion. And if you refuse to participate, you would be sentenced to the ring. So that's what I mean when I say that, like, it allegedly they only used it when violence was threatened. But if you didn't want to get violent, you could also get sentenced to the ring. There was really no way to win. And if the name doesn't give give it away, um, it, you were basically just beating the shit out of the kid that was sentenced to the ring. Like, it's absurd. There was also something called the electric source. They would pour, you know, electric source over a kid's head And what's in the electric source, you might ask? Usually a mixture of cigarette butts, leftover food, human shit and piss, just general water from the toilet as well to, I suppose, neutralise it a little bit, and also uh, literal rubbish from, from the rubbish bin. Trash. So from what I've told you so far, it's not too difficult to uh, understand why some kids would want to escape. Uh, because also escaping was the only way that you could get out because it was really hard to leave, basically impossible. For starters, getting through the levels wasn't easy. And as a reminder, the leveling system was how they determined when you were ready to graduate and actually leave. This is how Alan made their money. They explained to the parents that, hey, your kid will come here and they'll basically move through this set of levels and the higher they get, the closer they, they are to being ready to graduate. Um, We use this leveling system as a reflection of how well they perform in, you know, their community and society, things like that. How well they run things. Do they talk back? Is their attitude adjusting? Things like that. You only move through as you are participating accordingly. And, you know, the leveling system to the parents is like, oh, it's just, you know, they're just moving through and, and being recognized that they're becoming a better person. So, of course, as a parent, you're like, yep, that makes sense. Except to get from a non-strength, what you start out as, to a strength, literally just the second tier, took usually at least six months. And some kids never made it out of the non-strength status. The other reason why it was so hard to just get your parents to check you out was because you weren't allowed to tell them how bad it was. All incoming mail was ripped open and read and censored before it came to you as well as all of your outgoing mail. You could write your parents a letter explaining like, hey, I got electric source pulled over me last night and the only reason I haven't written to you in five weeks is because I was in the corner for the past four. They would rip open that letter, censor everything or just toss it out because they were like, there's none of this that you can send to your parents, sorry. And if you did try, you'd get punished anyway. So there was really no way of telling your parents that it sucked Also, they were forced to write to their parents these like phony letters saying how much they loved the program and how much fun they were having. So like as a parent, why would you pull your kid out? That's how they made their money. And this was a financial business before anything else. The kids had no real way of getting out. Some kids were so indoctrinated that they got to 23 sometimes before they turned around and went, oh shit, I can just sign myself out, can't I? But some kids... Uh, some, I said, like a lot of kids, tried to escape. It wasn't easy and also very rarely successful. Once they had noticed a kid had gone, which probably, you know, wasn't too long based on the fact that you've got these expediters running around with a bloody clipboard, writing down movements of hour by hour. It wasn't long before they worked out someone had run if they didn't see them do it themselves. Student trackers would be sent out to look and like a, they'd drive a car around and look in the immediate area. They also had trackers like students that were literally on patrol in the forest around the hunting lodge that was their first line of defense for when a kid tried to run out if they ran through the woods they would usually just run straight into a student who would then take them back they also would only report the child missing after like three days because they wanted to like keep it as controlled as possible before they told the police because likely if they told the police then the police found the kid 
the kid would be like, it's fucking awful there. They've been doing this, this, this and this. That's why I tried to escape. And then the police would tell the parents, it's like, that would not look good for Alan. So they tried to keep it under wraps and like an in-house kind of operation for as long as possible before they even told the police. They didn't give a fuck about the welfare of the kid. Like the kid could be in genuine trouble and distress during their escape, but they didn't care. They were like, we just want to see if we can handle this first before we get police involved. If you were caught, and brought back, which, you know, nine times out of 10, that was the case. You were dressed in a rabbit suit. You had leg shackles put on you. Your shoelaces were ripped out of your shoes. You also weren't allowed within 15 feet of a window or a door. And then the shoelace thing became like pretty common practice just for like any kid they thought might run away. They'd just take the shoelaces out of your shoes because it's really hard to run in a shoe without shoelaces, obviously. But for the kids who did manage to escape It wasn't just Alain that they were in danger of. 17-year-old Dawn Marie Birnbaum ran away from Alain during a school outing. Three days later, she was found dead in a snowbank near a highway, having been raped and murdered by a trucker. And she was just trying to hitchhike home. So in July of 1975, five years after the school had opened, a team of five inspectors came out to the school to have a look. It was a standard routine evaluation at this point. They'd kept the status of Alan and how like awful it was pretty contained. No one really knew that anything was going on inside the school. They were also probably, now that I think about it, letting kids graduate a little easier to begin with. I mean, in those first five years, probably alone, because they wanted to be able to showcase like a success rate. So for the most part, they're probably wasn't that much bad press coming out from Alan because they were also so good at containing it regardless. So a psychiatrist and four social workers from the Illinois Department of Child and Family Services visited Alan for two days. They spoke to the staffers and the residents. They like walked around the grounds and they basically just like observed how the school ran for two days. Here's where it gets bizarre. <laughs> Elan was so sure that the way that they were running the school was appropriate and like not a big deal, that despite being on their best behaviour for an evaluation, the report still found evidence of flagrant child abuse and severe violations of civil human rights. This evaluation team was so shocked that they called their department head and they received authorization to immediately remove some of the kids from this institution, Elan. And this department head in Illinois, her name was Mary Lee Leahy. Mary Lee Leahy. Her middle name is Lee. And then her last name is L-E-A-H-Y. Lee. Mary Lee Leahy. That cannot be your name. Pronunciation. Leahy. Oh, Leahy. (laughs) Now I'm feeling embarrassed, guys. Mary Lee Leahy. That makes much more sense. So she followed up with Governor Longley, basically just summarising the report into a letter to him because she was like, "Okay, we can't just leave this as like a little like standard evaluation. This actually needs to be escalated. She was appalled by instances of physical abuse, forced labour, spankings, punching one another in the boxing ring, senseless ditch digging, because that was another punishment if they were feeling like that's what you needed. They would just send you out to dig a ditch and then cover it back up. I also saw a video where one kid was saying that he was told to like take a wheelbarrow all the way down to a lake, which was like a a considerable distance away, like a few hundred meters away in extreme summer heat, fill it up with rocks and like water or something, bring it all the way back, empty it out and then go back down and do it again. Like it's just unbelievably menial forced labour punishments, basically. She cited instances of handcuffing a child to a table and the pouring of a mixture of food and human faeces over a child's head. That's our electric source. Denial of food and recreation, improper medical care, total lack of privacy. She ended her letter by saying the treatment model seems predicated on suspension of each child's liberties. They become automatons who conform to acceptable behaviour patterns after they find it hopeless to resist the will of their masters. And that's where I think she really just nails it on the head. Like, as kids came and realised how the place run, they realised that the only way they were going to get out is if they just completely succumbed to the way it was run and participate the way that they wanted them to, 
and hope that they come out the other end still a decent human being, despite being told to abuse kids on the daily. A spokesperson from the department told the Associated Press they had, quote, never seen anything quite so bizarre and degrading, and that the whole concept of this program seems to be a brainwashing technique. So at the time of this report at this Alan school, there were 217 children enrolled and five resident directors, which means that each resident director was responsible for 45 kids each. And to remind you, this is meant to be a rehabilitation program. Like these kids are troubled. These kids are going through some shit. You'd think that that ratio would be a little better. To make matters worse, all five of those resident directors they found were recovering drug addicts themselves and had graduated from the program as well. None of them had a college degree or any sense of training in this industry apart from having gone through the program themselves. One of the resident directors, for some reason, told the reporters that were, you know, making their account of the school for the government, that the reason he had been put in a line in the first place was because he had an issue with violence against females. So now he's a resident director, so he's in charge. And he also admitted that he was responsible for delivering like physical punishments to female members in the school. So like he had an issue with violence against women, the whole reason why he went to Alan and was like proud to admit that he was also the one that was responsible for like giving spankings to girls and stuff. So gross. Young girls as well. All of them were under 18, like f for the most part, unless they for some reason were still indoctrinated. As I said before, some people got to 23 before they left. So like, I'm sure there were some kids that were a little older, but having said that, the only ones that were getting punished were probably not, like if you're indoctrinated, you're probably playing by the rules. So you're not going to get punished. So if, I, I can pretty much confidently say that he, this guy that had issues with violence against women was assaulting female minors. Gross. They also found that every kid that went to Alan, when they first got there, they had like a classic lice shower. So like to get rid of any head lice, they had a full body strip search. Women were subjected to like a pap smear, like a vaginal smear and a rectal examination. Men were expected to produce semen in a cup, so literally jerk off into a cup to test for any venereal diseases or like STIs. And on this, the evaluation team went to real doctors, separate from this entirely, and told them. And the doctors were apparently like appalled at the medical malpractice. As I said before, shoes got to a point where like most of them didn't have shoelaces anymore. They had like a box with all the shoelaces that they'd put them in and like proudly show. One kid was asking for more shoes because like his shoes were run down. And so to fix this issue for him, they just took his shoes away and he wasn't allowed to wear shoes. By the time he got to Chicago, it said, I wasn't sure if this was home for him, but by the time he left Alan, they found that he had blood poisoning in one of his feet. So once the governor had this 70-page report, he got Maine's Department of Human Services to issue another report independently. One of the teen staff members said that after that first report, everything changed. Like, they basically had to stand there and lie through their teeth to any evaluator that came through. And what they couldn't explain away, they would just describe as the exception rather than the rule. And that teen staff member, his name was Ken. Now, Ken was referred to Alan by a doctor in his area called Dr. Marvin Schwartz. He started to become known as Mr. Adolescent Illinois because he basically was responsible for sending like a huge majority of the kids to Alan in the early years. Hundreds and hundreds of kids, apparently. But here's where it gets funky and not at all surprising. Dr. Marvin Schwartz was really good friends with Jerry Davidson, one of the founders, obviously. They went back a really long way and Dr. Marvin Schwartz was getting a kickback for every child he sent to Alan. And to give you an idea on how much he might have been making for the kickbacks, the number I'm about to give you isn't the number that he was given, obviously, but it's estimated that Alan was earning $300,000 per year just for this program in straight profit. And to account for inflation today, that's 1.7 million US dollars. It's not hard to imagine that depending on Dr. Schwartz's percentage, like for his kickback for sending a kid there, he was probably making a fucking fortune. 
Philip B. Taft wrote an article on the Alan School, and in part of this article, he kind of compares the running of Alan to Nazi concentration camps. Now, this was not at all suggesting that what these kids at Elan were going through was as destructive or as awful as the Holocaust. That's not how he meant it. He meant it in the sense that there was a ridiculous percentage of kids that after they graduated would become staff at the school in the same way that it became a, a bit of a thing where a lot of Jews would end up adorning like the leather dress of their guards after they were freed. So it was kind of like a Stockholm syndrome situation. I saw, I, I've heard a little bit of mixed stuff about that saying because I think people have like lost what he meant by it and thought that he was just comparing it to the Holocaust. He wasn't. So I just wanted to make that perfectly clear. I think that makes sense. I think he was just referring to it in the sense of the Stockholm syndrome in that same vein. Like they were abused so much at this school. And yet for some reason, when they graduated, they wanted to stay and become one of the staff members to then inflict it on new kids. Now, in their brochures, Alan boasted an 80% success rate. According to them, 80% of the kids who went through the program and successfully graduated went on to live a happy, drug-free lifestyle living as a law-abiding citizen. But when Vermont surveyed 71 former Elan residents, they found that of the 71, 12 were in jail, 17 were working or in school, and 42 were, in the words of one official, living marginal lives that included petty crime, frequent unemployment, and overuse of alcohol and drugs. Very different from the 80% claim, which I think we can all confidently say they pulled that number straight out of their ass. In 1981, a Rhode Island judge made another request for a, a more in-depth study because he was seeing allegations of abuse and neglect that were surfacing in family court juvenile proceedings that a lot of them were seemingly having stories of like, oh yeah, I do this because of my time at Elan or like this happened because of my treatment at Elan or like we sent him to Elan but it didn't help. And this judge was like, what the fuck is this? Why does this keep coming up? We need to do another uh, look into it. Because the other thing to note is that all of these previous studies weren't really getting the publicity that you would expect them to. They weren't really making headlines. In fact, there was like a 60 minute type interview with Joseph Ricci around this time. And he was such a con artist and so charismatic that by the end of it, you're kind of watching it going like, oh, yeah, that makes sense that you would pour electric sauce over a 13-year-old's head because they smiled. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he was so good at portraying this school as, like, a really fantastic resource for wealthy parents to use if they were at their last wits. That's why this judge, this Rhode Island judge, was like, what is going on here? Let, like, can we look into this a little bit further? So this report was probably the most comprehensive report that had done to date, and it cited, again, a flagrant violation of individual civil rights. The report also said that they were concerned about the lack of actual official staff and trained staff at the school, because, like, as I said before about the business team, these kids were legitimately handling the ingoings and outgoings of this business. Like, it was being run by kids. And for context, like just on Joseph Ricci again, when that first report came out in 1975, he was only 29. So by the time this next Rhode Island one comes out, he's in his 30s. He's still so young. He's making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year at the time, which today would be millions. And the investigators from this Rhode Island report were also really concerned that all the checks and balances weren't being officialized by Joe or any, like, adult. It was all fucking kids. Now, Joe was starting to, like, lose his mind. He started to get really paranoid. I don't know if he was back on the drugs. I don't think that's a totally unfair assumption to make because he started to get super paranoid and I didn't really... Maybe I missed it. I didn't see anything anywhere where people were, like, alleging that he was a drug addict again. But it kind of does, like, this behavior does kind of scream that to me, at least. He was always saying that there were people after him. And there was an unauthorized biography written by this woman called uh, Duck in a Raincoat. 
And it went into his, like, 1986 failed attempt at running for governor. Hi, I'm Joseph Ritchie, Democratic candidate for governor. Alleged ties to organized crime, like apparently he had some issues with the mafia. Also really weird, he would get female students from Milan to guard him at night. For some reason, only females. Shocker. But, like, wherever he was staying, if he was staying at the school for some time, like, they, he would get girls to like stand outside overnight and like make sure no one was coming in to get him so he would say and then there were the suspicious fires ah yes so one of them in 1983 uh the scarborough downs compound had a fire we've been talking about the poland main one but as i said there were a couple of other ones um the scarborough downs one was allegedly where like a lot of this really bad abuse occurred apparently um, the clubhouse burnt down, which Joe claimed was arson by the people out to get him. But there was no water in the private fire hydrants on the lot that night, so they couldn't fight the fire themselves, first of all. Second, the phones were out that night for some reason, just that night. So one of the security guards had to physically drive 10 minutes to the local fire department to tell them himself that it was on fire. But then research into the fire investigative file tells a little bit more of an interesting story that involves stolen confidential Elan files, cash payoffs, and meetings between an ex-con explosives expert and Joseph Ricci just three months before the fires occurred. <laughs> like, be a little bit more mysterious next time, Joe. I think it'll play in your favour. And then to tie that up in a neat little bow, an ugly, gross, disgusting bow, a lot of Alan residents, staff and students kind of alluded to the fact that Joe had sexual relations with a lot of the female students at the school, um, but they were too scared to go on record at the time. Joseph Ricci had a cousin named John, and John said that he knew of at least two female students at Alan that Joe was having sex with. There's at least two that was like on record, but like, I mean, huge shock there, guys. Are you shocked? Let me know if you're shocked. So despite all of these findings and reports, the school just kept getting more and more popular. Like there were so many kids being sent. As I said, they were flying across the country. Apparently there were some international students as well that were coming to Alan. And it didn't really slow down until Joseph Ricci actually died from, I think it was lung cancer in 2001, which, well done lung cancer for that one. You took a good one there. His wife, Sharon Terry, took over the business and she started running it from then on. She made some changes to make it better, quote unquote. Uh, she just took away the ring. That's literally all, all she took away. But kids were still being sent to a dumpster to sleep in a dumpster at night as a punishment. So... You know, <laughs> I'm just throwing all these other little punishments in throughout the episode to like remind you that like this shit goes so deep and I'm sure there's some stuff that happened that I missed, to be honest. Eventually, as the internet became more popular and remembering this is 2001, like MSN didn't come out until 99. So MSN was only like two or three years old at the time. Stories from Alan started to gain a little bit of traction on like forums and things like that. Then almost a decade later, in 2010, a former Alan student made a post on Reddit that went completely viral and he was documenting his time at Alan. And you can still read that post today. It's still on Reddit. And all of the comments, one of the reasons why it went so viral is because like, you know, it's the internet typically, especially on Reddit. Oh my God. When you say that something happened, usually most of the comments are like, okay, prove it, or like, I doubt this happened or whatever. All of the comments under this post, for the most part, were like other ex-students that were like vouching, just being like, yeah, that happened. Also, this happened. I don't know if that happened to you. Like all of these ex-students were just under this post being like, oh yeah, at my Alan, at Alan 3 or Alan 6 or whatever, they used to do this to us. It was basically the nail in the coffin for Alan because... This post gained so much traction that in 2011, I think, just a few months after this post was published, Sharon Terry announced that Alan was closing forever. Woo! 
She said that it was closing due to declining enrollment and resulting financial difficulties, which was directly caused by the Reddit post, which is actually pretty impressive. Well done. So that's the Alan School for you. Um, it's just an interesting story of yet another you know, piece of evidence of what money can do to a moral compass. I'm sure Joseph Ricci started with an idea of it being a, an actual good place to send your kids, but I suppose the only way he could make that amount of money was to ensure that the kids weren't able to leave easily, and he worked out how to do that basically by breaking them down into a shadow of themselves. I mean, I saw, like, there's so many, when I tell you there are so many, like, first-hand accounts that I didn't go into, I'm just thinking of one now about this girl who, like, came from a, a pretty wealthy family and she got a general meeting for something I can't remember what I think she was just like withdrawing herself from activities and like not participating as much probably like feeling depressed and just like not wanting to be there anymore she got a general meeting and like she had a complete panic attack like she was having a mental breakdown and during this general meeting she like peed on the floor and she got a really severe punishment and after that general meeting she was basically catatonic like medically diagnosed as such once she finally left. This school caused so much PTSD for so many students that went there. I also want to pull one out for the parents who didn't fucking know it was happening. Like, can you imagine spending that amount of money and your kid comes out and you finally, like all of this stuff comes out years later and you're like, oh my God, like I cannot believe this was happening to you kind of thing. I also want to pull one out for all of the kids who unfortunately took their own lives after they left Elan and the kids that were just scarred forever, you know, that didn't get to have their fresh start because, I mean, from the get-go, once they got to Elan, they were basically shot down and made to feel like absolutely nothing. So to start there and for them to break your self-esteem down so low as a starting point, how are you meant to get better at all? But yeah, it's, I think the troubled teen industry is also a very interesting one to me as well. I, I can't help but feel it's a very American thing. Let me know what you think, please, um, in the comments or email me or send me a message on Instagram. I feel like the troubled teen industry just isn't really a thing in Australia. I think we have a different culture for parenting. That's not to say that you're doing a bad job in America. I just think it, it is interesting to see these industries crop up, these for-profit industries where for the most part, a lot of them have severe reports and accounts of abuse and just horrible practice in the way that they're run. Paris Hilton went to one in Utah and she talks about it in her documentary that she was basically abused for her time there. And she tries to find people that went to the school at the same time as her, but she's like really struggling to find them. Even the like the, the ranches that Dr. Phil sends the kids to, apparently they are absolutely awful. So, yeah, I've got no kids, so I have absolutely zero right to tell people how to parent their kids. But it is interesting to me to, to think that you would want to send your kid away for months and months and years at a time to fix an issue like this. Yeah, it's really awful. And my heart goes out to any kid that was sent away for any amount of time away from their family and friends and general environment that they're happy in because their parents decided that they weren't up to scratch. I think that's really hard and I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm very, very sorry for you. I'm very sorry. That is all for this week's episode. If you're on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. And if you are listening on an app of your choice, I would very much appreciate a written review if you're on Apple and just a star rating if you're on any of the others. I appreciate you, love you, have a great day, afternoon, evening, circle whichever applies, and I'll see you guys next time. Adios.